I'm Richard Westoby and welcome to the IVF Daddies podcast. In today's episode, we have the pleasure of talking with Dr. Brooke Friedman from the San Diego Fertility Center. Hello. Hello. Dr. Friedman is board certified in obstetrics and gynecology and board certified in reproductive endocrinology and infertility. Dr. Freeman is the only doctor who has received San Diego Magazine's prestigious top fertility doctor recognition seven times, surpassing any other fertility specialist in San Diego. Bravo! <laughs> Thank you, Richard. In addition, she has also an amazing reputation within the patient community and has received multiple awards, including the Patient's Choice Award, the Compassionate Doctor Recognition, and the esteemed Top 10 Physicians Award amongst others. Dr. Freeman graduated from Princeton University, summer cum laude, and earned her medical degree from the University of California, San Francisco Medical School, graduating at the top of her class. I feel very honored to have you here today. <laughs> That's very kind. So we are here in Brussels at the annual Men Having Babies conference, where people from all over Europe come to learn about IVF and surrogacy. And for those who don't have the ability to come here, I'd love to get from you, Dr. Freeman, some advice on how to feel more comfortable around choosing your IVF clinic. Can you give us some top tips? It's incredibly overwhelming to even start thinking about IVF when you're at the start of your process. And then you're like, okay, and where do I start? Where do I choose a clinic? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's such a personal process. It's such an intimate process. So it's quite understandably daunting to put your faith in people you don't know. So I think it's really important to choose a clinic that you feel comfortable with. And so that's why for us at our clinic, it's really important to us to offer the ability to have free consultations, so especially with our international patients. It's nice for us to have the opportunity to have a space to educate, to answer questions. Free consultations. So I could set up a time to talk to you about the entire process and Absolutely. So we have an hour set aside to talk over Zoom so I can help explain the process, demystify the process, answer questions, wow. and really tailor that conversation to the needs of each patient. So for us, it's really a passion. It's my passion to help yeah. patients build their families. And so part of that is education, right? Knowledge is power. So we really want to break down the process into components that feel manageable, that feel less overwhelming, and help create a roadmap that's feasible, that's achievable. I love that. Knowledge is power. It I mean, is. it's because in IVF and in medicine and anything, like you don't know what you don't know. You don't. And unfortunately, there's so much bad information on the internet. Yeah, right. <laughs> the internet's a powerful place. There's a lot of good information. There's a lot of bad information. It's hard to sift through the noise. And so I think finding a clinic that you can trust that is reputable, that has excellent success rates, that's been doing this for quite a long time, that has a well-established track record, that is key. You know, yeah. finding a clinic that has the experience, the the success rates, and has the ability to connect with people on a personal level and support them through the journey. Because there's yeah. the science and then there's the art. The IVF lab is key. The success rates are key. But how do we support intended parents on their journey? How do we support each patient along the way? And for us, that's really part of our mission. If you were to think about the top tip of demystifying terminology, mm -hmm. what would you say to, say, for example, I came into the clinic and we were having a conversation mm -hmm. about why would I choose to work with you as a mm -hmm. doctor mm -hmm. instead of throwing like medical stuff at me? But what else would you throw in there as well? I think, for example, this is all I've done for the past 10 years. All I do is IVF. So that's my passion. That is what I do every single day. So I think it's really important to find someone, find a clinic that has that experience yeah. and can help explain things in a way that can make it feel more manageable and less overwhelming. And I think what's important is it's not one size fits all. Everyone's journey is different. And we know that an IVF, particularly with third party reproduction, if it's egg donation and surrogacy can be overwhelming. So it's our job to make it easier, not okay, make so it harder. Third party reproduction, meaning? Meaning using either sperm donation, egg donation, or a surrogate in contrast to what we call like autologous IVF or someone that's like, for example, a heterosexual couple struggling with infertility where a woman's using her own eggs, her partner's sperm, and then transferring back to her. Okay. Uterus. So there's a third party that's involved. Exactly right. Okay, great. So that's what third party is. Exactly. Okay. What is the difference in IVF 
between those cohorts of people that you were just talking about? It's so different for everyone. And I think for us, we help so many different types of patients. I have women who are single intended mothers by choice. I have single intended fathers. I have same sex female couples, same sex male couples. So the most important thing for patients to understand is they are not alone. I think Amazing. especially perhaps a couple facing infertility, it can feel very isolating. It can feel like you're the only one going through this process. And it's just not true. One out of every eight couples struggles with infertility. So it's a staggering number. You're not alone and there is a path forward. Like yeah. we're here to help. And I think that is really important to take mm -hmm. away that you're not alone. That Because mm -hmm. I remember when I was going through this, it felt very overwhelming. And I was just like, I don't know who to talk to. Mm -hmm. I knew one couple who had done it. There was not that information. And I think what you're saying is that actually there are other people. And, Absolutely. And you can also help to navigate me through the waters almost absolutely and there is a actually quite a large community out there everyone's journey is unique and is kind of individual to them but there's a lot of paths forward there's a lot there's no one vision of a family there's a lot of different uh, types to ways to create a family and and we're here to help why would i go to the united states when i could i not just use a clinic in europe yeah, I think a lot of people are surprised to learn that surrogacy is illegal right. in most areas of the world. So the United States is really unique, actually, in that it is legal. It is a very transparent process with safeguards for not only the intended parents, but for the surrogates as well. And because there's a long history of surrogacy being legal in the United States, there's a framework there that protects everyone. And then what are those safeguards? like? So for us, with the IVF process with intent to transfer to a surrogate, there are a lot of rules that we need to follow. And some of those rules are created by the FDA in the United States. In what is the FDA? So the Food and Drug Administration basically has certain rules or guidelines in terms of what infectious disease needs to be checked, for example, for someone providing sperm. When do those tests, when are those tests done in relationship to embryo creation or sperm freezing? How do we screen a surrogate? So there are so many rules that we are very experienced in following because this is sort of core to what we do. This is our, our bread and butter. We're doing this every day. And so we know how to follow those rules, those guidelines to ensure that all guidelines are met from a medical perspective to ensure safety for all parties. And then we work hand in hand with surrogate agencies and attorneys to ensure that all the appropriate legal steps are followed, again, to protect all parties. So I think experience is in, in is key, right? Absolutely. If you do one surrogacy cycle a year versus doing 200, you're going to know a lot more about the ins and outs of how it works. And, and that is fundamental. So what you're saying is, if you were to break down how many IVF cycles do you do a year versus how many surrogacy cycles do you do a year? Yeah, so we, we have a lot of experience with surrogacy. We're actually the busiest clinic in the United States with regard to surrogacy cases. So for us, we're doing a lot of IVF, not just for heterosexual couples facing infertility, but again, for single moms by choice, single dads by choice, intended fathers who are planning to create embryos through egg donation and surrogacy. So we really offer the full spectrum of fertility care and have a tremendous amount of experience really with all of these different pathways. And I guess one of the questions that has, springs to mind is, is it only gay men going through surrogacy or is it who are your patients? So we're helping a lot of different kinds of patients. For example, I see a lot of patients who are either single women who have struggled with infertility or a heterosexual couple struggling with infertility. And for me, I am fortunate to, to have children and they're the light of my life. So for me, to be able to help people build their families is an incredible honor and, and responsibility. And I know that for couples who have already struggled with infertility, their journey has already been long, even before our first consult. So there's a tremendous amount of grief and loss through that infertility process. And we always want to be sensitive to that because we know that this journey is not easy. And there's unfortunately sometimes a lot of trauma and loss even before we're able to meet with an individual patient. So right. 
for us, again, it's really my job, it's our job to help support people through that process, understanding sometimes they're coming to us very raw and struggling because they've been through already a tremendous amount of loss. And they may not have had anybody to turn to to talk about it. Absolutely. They've been sitting at home worrying yeah. Because I was a gay man, I turned up and I was like, oh, let's have a baby. <laughs> and that's wonderful. And so I think when I'm able to help my intended fathers who are coming to me saying, yay, let's proceed with this egg donation surrogacy process, that is different than, let's say, uh, a heterosexual couple struggling with infertility or a woman who's lost her uterus. So there's a, a grieving process because mm. that's a loss I guess that needs to be grieved. you have to grieve for the child you never had. The right, to make space for the child you are going to have. Right? And that's amazing. Make uh, space for the child you're going to have. But that's not easy. And everyone's journey, that's going to take different amounts of time for different people. And I think being respectful of that is important. And we work hand in hand with mental health professionals because that's really critically important to think through this process regarding how are we going to have this conversation with our future child? What is the origin story? How are we going to be transparent? And I use the word transparency intentionally. It's not a question of disclosure. I have this conversation a lot with heterosexual couples. The question is, do we tell our child? How do we tell our child? And I always encourage there's something, there's a negative connotation to disclosure that sort of implies there's yeah. something negative that needs to be shared. And that's why I'm saying transparency, meaning being honest, being open. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. There's nothing shameful about this process of going through IVF using an egg donor, for example, or using a surrogate. There's just different ways why, of building a family. And, and this is the thing. Why is there the taboo that if you can't have a child then you go through IVF, you're a failure. I'm like, I don't understand that. What yeah. Do you see that a lot? I see it all the time. So I think it's, to be quite honest, it's when I'm meeting with a couple that has struggled with infertility, a heterosexual couple, sometimes a woman will start crying during the consult and, and I'll say, you've made it a really long time because often people start to cry as soon as they sit down in my office. And that's understandable because there is so much sadness. And I think especially as women, we often put a lot of pressure on ourselves to what does it mean to be a mother? What does it mean to be able to get pregnant or not to get pregnant? So I think a lot of patients blame themselves, which is unfortunately one of the things I really try to help reassure my patients is it's not your fault. In infertility, we talk about factors, meaning why is someone having a hard time getting pregnant? Maybe there's male factor. Maybe there's a challenge with the sperm. Maybe there's a uterine factor. It's not a fault, right? It's not under anyone's control. I'm actually loving it. There are two things that you have said to me that are super powerful just now. You're not alone. It's not your fault. It's true. And if anybody's listening out there, I want you to take that home. You are not alone and it's not your fault. It's true. And sometimes I'll tell patients who are struggling when they'll say, it's my fault. I'm, I'm in there blaming themselves. I will say, I would really like you to be as kind to yourself as you would be to a friend going through the same process. Would you say to a friend, you're not doing enough. Didn't you do acupuncture? Are you eating organic? Sometimes we blame ourselves for and it's so important to show that same kindness to yourself, to know that you're not alone. Infertility is a medical diagnosis like any other. And there's hope, yeah. right? There's hope. So be kind to yourself. You're just yeah. filled with nuggets. <laughs> I'm loving this. It's, you're not alone. Yeah. It's not your fault. And be kind to yourself. Yeah. I think actually in life in general, we're just not kind enough to ourselves. It's true. We're so hard on ourselves. And we would never say... The things we say, they say to ourselves, to a friend. Change the narrative. Yeah. And if, if there's anything that we can do is to change that narrative. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm in awe and so respectful of everything you do every day. It's amazing. No, oh, thank you. It's um, an honor. It's a, it really is a privilege to get to do what we do to help people build their families. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's If anybody has any questions for Dr. Freeman, please do send them through to us. We will forward them on to her and we will get you that free consultation. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being with you, Richard. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to learn more about IVF and surrogacy, then please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also, please share and follow our social media handle at IVF Daddies. We are here to answer any questions and to guide you through this very personal process.